Hi there, it's Friday the 20th of December 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to ITB. Let's get started. In regard to Pillar 1, a US government official, Chip Harter, this week provided some insights on the US position. Firstly, in regard to the issue of whether Pillar 1 should be mandatory or alternatively a safe harbour, he said that the US will wait until the design of Pillar 1 is clearer before deciding on that issue. In regard to the type of companies to which Pillar 1 should apply, he said that the US would like to see Pillar 1 apply to two types of companies. B2C companies, in other words, consumer-facing businesses in all industries, and digital companies, both B2C and B2B. And in regard to the situations in which a Pillar 1 nexus would arise for a particular jurisdiction, he said that the US has identified four situations in which a nexus should arise. Firstly, a multinational already has a taxable presence in a jurisdiction under the current rules. Secondly, a multinational sells digital goods or services into the jurisdiction from offshore. Thirdly, a multinational sells goods into a jurisdiction without directly participating in the market there, but it makes substantial investments offshore in targeted advertising or brand development. And fourthly, a multinational licenses or franchises consumer brands into a jurisdiction from offshore. Pascal saint amand this week provided insight on the plans for the next couple of months. Firstly, the inclusive framework will meet in January to discuss and hopefully approve a paper on the outline of the design of Pillar 1. That paper would then be submitted to the G20 finance ministers who will meet in Riyadh in February together with two other papers, one on the state of negotiations and the other being an update on Pillar 2. He plans that the OECD will publicly release the three papers in February. As expected, China and the US did reach an 11th hour deal to avert the latest round of tariff increases. The countries have announced that they have reached agreement on their so-called Phase 1 trade deal. This will be reflected in a formal agreement which is expected to be signed and go into force in January. According to a tweet from President Trump, we will begin negotiations on the Phase 2 deal immediately, rather than waiting until after the 2020 election. For a copy of the USTR press release on the Phase 1 deal, please go to our website or app. After the UK leaves the EU as scheduled on the 31st of January, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is planning for the next phase of the relationship between the UK and the EU, the negotiation of a free trade agreement, to be completed in record time by the 31st of December 2020. The OECD and Brazil's tax authorities have released a joint report on transfer pricing in Brazil and what needs to be done for Brazil's TP rules to comply with the OECD's transfer pricing guidelines, a necessary step for Brazil to become an OECD member. For a copy of the report, please go to our website or app. In Australia, the government has released for public comment 
draft legislation which will make amendments to the country's hybrid mismatch rules. Public comments are requested by the 24th of January. For a copy of the draft legislation, please go to our website or app. Also in Australia, the tax authorities have released a public statement on a settlement of a tax dispute with Google, which resulted in Google paying an additional 330 million US dollars of tax. From the statement, it appears that all or a large part of the tax is under or in response to Australia's Ma law, which can deem a PE to exist. For a copy of the statement, please go to our website or app. In India, the government has issued several notifications which require the use of electronic invoices in B2B supplies by registered persons with an annual turnover of the equivalent of 14 million US dollars. This mandatory requirement will be effective the 1st of April 2020. In addition, a voluntary system of electronic invoices will operate from the 1st of January to the 31st of March 2020. There are four notifications which relate to the mandatory requirement and one notification which relates to the voluntary system. For a copy of all five of these notifications, please go to our website or app. In Indonesia, the government has issued a new regulation on tax incentives for investments in certain business sectors and regions. The regulation is effective from the 13th of December 2019. For a copy of the regulation, please go to our website or app. In Japan, the ruling coalition parties have approved the 2020 tax reform outline. Several items caught my eye. Firstly, two new tax incentives will be introduced. The first is a 15% tax credit for companies which invest in 5G infrastructure. And the second is a plan to allow companies to deduct 25% of their investment in venture companies which are less than 10 years old. Both incentives are designed to encourage Japanese companies to spend their significant cash reserves. Secondly, in an interesting move, Japan's existing corporate tax consolidation system will be replaced by rules for tax loss transfers within a corporate group. As with the current system, the new rules will be optional. The replacement will be effective the 1st of April 2022. And thirdly, dividend stripping rules will be introduced to address tax planning which involves a resident or non-resident subsidiary paying dividends which are subject to the dividends received deduction, followed by a sale of the shares in the subsidiary for a capital loss. In Malaysia, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the income tax treatment of foreign exchange gains and losses. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. Also in Malaysia, the tax authorities have issued updated guidance on withholding tax on special classes of income. For a copy of the updated guidance, please go to our website or app. In New Zealand, the government has announced proposed changes to the income tax treatment of lessees under operating leases, in particular to allow lessees to achieve a closer alignment between the tax treatment and the accounting treatment under IFRS 16. For a copy of the government's announcement, please go to our website or app. In Singapore, the tax authorities have issued updated guidance in regard to the income tax treatment of a separate trade for a company which has been awarded a pioneer tax incentive. For a copy of the updated guidance, please go to our website or app.
In Denmark, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the interest deduction limitation rules. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. The European Court of Justice has decided a case in regard to the 1990 version of the Parent Subsidiary Directive. The taxpayer company received dividends from a subsidiary resident in a member state. For Belgian income tax purposes, the taxpayer had two relevant deductions. The first, called DTI, is a deduction equal to the amount of the dividends it received. This deduction is intended to comply with the requirement in the parent subsidiary directive for the parent company to exempt dividends received from member state subsidiaries. The second deduction, called DRC, is a notional interest deduction to which the taxpayer is entitled under Belgian tax law in regard to its equity capital. Under the Belgian tax law, both of these deductions are able to be carried forward for use in future years, if the taxable income in the current year is insufficient. However, deductibility in future years is dependent on there being sufficient taxable income in those years. The DTI can be carried forward indefinitely, and the DRC can be carried forward for seven years. The issue in the case concerns the order in which the two deductions are to be used if carried forward to future years. Under Belgian law, the DTI has priority. It's deducted first from available taxable income. If the remaining taxable income is then sufficient, the DRC is then deducted. The problem with that ordering rule is that the DRC carry forward period is limited to seven years. It's possible that due to the priority given to the deduction of the carried forward DTI, there might not be sufficient remaining taxable income to deduct the DRC during the seven years. The court decided that that problem constitutes a breach of the parent subsidiary directive. The court said this, it is therefore apparent that the combination of the DTI scheme applicable to dividends received, the order of deductions set out in national legislation, and the time limit on the ability to use DRC can have the effect that receiving dividends is likely to result in the parent company losing another tax advantage provided for by national legislation and therefore that company being taxed more heavily than would have been the case if it had not received dividends from its non-resident subsidiary or if the dividends had simply been excluded from the parent company's tax base. In these circumstances, contrary to the objective pursued by the parent subsidiary directive, the receipt of such dividends is not fiscally neutral for the parent company. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In the EU, member states are trying to enact national legislation to transpose three key tax directives before the 31st of December 2019 deadline. Firstly, the four VAT quick fixes. You'll remember that in last week's ITB, I mentioned that both the Czech Republic and Romania will miss the deadline. Secondly, the DAC 6 rules in regard to mandatory disclosure of certain tax planning arrangements. And thirdly, various parts of the two ATAD directives, the exit taxation rules in ATAD 1 and all of ATAD 2, except the rules in regard to reverse hybrid mismatches, which have a deadline of the 31st of December, 2021. The European Parliament has approved the new rules for the exchange between member states of VAT payment data, effective the 1st of January, 2024. You'll remember that ECOFIN agreed to these rules in November. 
The European Commission has approved, under EU state aid rules, five schemes to support maritime transport in Cyprus, Denmark, Estonia, Poland and Sweden. According to the Commission, the schemes encourage ship registration in Europe and contribute to the global competitiveness of the sector without unduly distorting competition. For a copy of the Commission's press release on this matter, please go to our website or app. In France, the Supreme Court has decided a case in regard to the freedom to provide services under Articles 56 and 57 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The court held that France's withholding tax on outbound service fee payments, which is imposed on a gross basis, must be applied on a net basis by allowing deductions for direct professional fees. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Germany, the government released a draft bill which will implement key parts of ATAD 1 and 2, as well as some other major changes. A comprehensive reform of Germany's transfer pricing rules and significant changes to the CFC rules. However, the government has now announced the postponement of the legislative process. Commentators have suggested that there is disagreement concerning whether to retain the current 25% rate in the high tax exception in the CFC rules, in light of the progress towards a global minimum tax in the Inclusive Frameworks Pillar 2. For a copy of the draft bill, please go to our website or app. Also in Germany, the tax authorities have issued guidance on the attribution of profits to a PE, which consists of a tangible asset, but has no employees. For example, wind or solar power plant. According to the guidance, the PE can be characterized as either the owner or the lessee of the tangible asset for the purposes of profit attribution. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Italy, the tax authorities have released a redacted private ruling on the application of the loss carry forward limitation rules following a merger. For a copy of the ruling, please go to our website or app. In Serbia, legislation has been enacted to amend the corporate income tax law. Only one item caught my eye. A foreign tax credit will be given for foreign withholding tax on service fee income, with the amount of the credit limited to 6% of the gross income. In Sweden, the tax authorities have released guidance to reflect a recent Supreme Court decision on the Swedish tax treatment of a US DISC. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In Switzerland, the government has launched a public consultation on proposed amendments to the legislation for implementing double tax treaties. The proposed amendments cover MAP procedures, withholding tax relief, and some other topics. The consultation will run until the 27th of March. For a copy of the government's announcement, please go to our website or app. In the UK, as I'm sure you know, the Conservative Party won last week's general election with an overall majority. During the election campaign, it announced or confirmed these important tax matters. The scheduled reduction in the corporation tax rate from 19% to 17% will be deferred. The R&D credit rate will be increased from 12% to 13% and a review of the definition of R&D will be made to include R&D on cloud computing and data. The digital services tax will be introduced with effect from the 1st of April 2020 and there will be no increase in VAT rates during the term of the next parliament.
In Algeria, the 2020 Finance Act has been signed into law. Only one item caught my eye. In regard to VAT, online sales of digitalised goods and certain electronically supplied services will be subject to VAT at the reduced rate of 9%. For a copy of the government's announcement on the Act, please go to our website or app. In Israel, a district court has decided a transfer pricing business restructuring case in favour of the taxpayer. What makes this case noteworthy is that in 2017, the same judge decided the Gateco case, another business restructuring case, in favour of the tax authorities. After that victory, the tax authorities released guidance and issued a large number of assessments in business restructuring situations. In other words, situations where an Israeli company, usually after being acquired by a foreign multinational, restructures its business away from being an IP entrepreneur. That situation was claimed to exist in this recent Broadcom case. And as I said, the taxpayer won. Prior to the business restructuring, the taxpayer in the Broadcom case was indeed an IP entrepreneur in Israel. This situation is shown on the left. The taxpayer carried on the business of developing, producing and supplying specialised equipment. The business restructuring involved two major changes to that business model, as shown on the right. Firstly, the taxpayer provided R&D and marketing services on a cost plus basis to two affiliates. And secondly, the taxpayer licensed its existing IP to a third affiliate in return for royalties set at 14% of the affiliate's revenue. Importantly, the court said that in the post-business restructuring period, the taxpayer continued as an operating company, a service provider and a licensor, and its revenue and employee numbers increased. The court held that a business restructuring does not necessarily involve the transfer of an asset. In particular, the court said that in the present case, even though the newly developed IP would not be owned by the taxpayer, that does not mean that the existing IP has been sold. The court contrasted this case with the 2017 Gateco case, where the Israeli taxpayer company, after the business restructuring, became an empty corporate shell. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In Qatar, the government has issued executive regulations under the new income tax law. Several items caught my eye. Firstly, outbound payments for services which are used or consumed in Qatar are deemed to have a source in Qatar. Secondly, transfer pricing documentation requirements are introduced. Thirdly, in the domestic law definition of PE, time thresholds are included in regard to construction projects and services. And finally, withholding tax will be triggered in regard to outbound payments which remain due but unpaid for more than 12 months. In Argentina, the new administration of President Fernandez is making its mark with tax changes. There have been three interesting changes either proposed or made this week. Firstly, the President issued a decree which removes the cap on the 12% export duty. As a consequence, the aggregate tax on exports of, for example, soybeans is increased from 24.5% to 
to 30% of the FOB value. For a copy of the decree, please go to our website or app. Secondly, the government has introduced into Congress a bill which will impose a new tax on the purchase of foreign currency. The tax rate will be 30%. Yes, that's right, 30%. Taxable events will be the purchase of foreign currency for the purpose of savings, payment of travel expenses, or payment of services provided by foreign parties. For example, streaming services. And thirdly, the government has introduced into Congress a bill which would suspend the reduction in the corporate income tax rate from 30% to 25%, which was scheduled to take effect on the 1st of January 2020. The bill would also suspend the increase in the dividend withholding tax rate from 7% to 13%. In Brazil, the highest administrative tax court has decided a case on deductibility of outbound royalties. The case concerns Brazil's limitation on deduction of outbound royalties which are paid to non-resident shareholders. The court held that that limitation applies only to royalties paid to non-resident direct shareholders. It does not apply to royalties which are paid to non-resident related parties which do not hold shares in the Brazilian payer company. In Canada, the Supreme Court has decided a case concerning sovereign immunity in a purely domestic setting. The dispute was between the federal tax authorities and a crown corporation owned by the British Columbia province in Canada. The Crown Corporation won and lost the case. Let me explain. The court held that the Crown Corporation was immune from federal GST based on sovereign immunity. However, the court also held that the British Columbia government had agreed to pay federal GST in some situations and the Crown Corporation was covered by that agreement. For a copy of this case, please go to our website or app. In the US, Treasury and the IRS have issued final regulations in regard to dividend equivalence. According to the final regulations, this Treasury decision finalises the 2017 proposed regulations without any substantive change. As a related matter, the IRS has issued an advanced version of Notice 2020-2, which announces additional time for taxpayers to comply with the final regulations. For a copy of both documents, please go to our website or app. Also in the US, Treasury and the IRS have issued final regulations in regard to corporate spin-offs. For a copy of the final regs, please go to our website or app. One more set of regulations in the US. Treasury and the IRS have issued proposed regulations under Section 162M in regard to the limitation of deductions for certain employee remuneration in excess of $1 million. For a copy of the proposed regulations, please go to our website or app. And finally, in the US, the Tax Foundation has released an interesting report on US state sales taxes after the Supreme Court decision in the Wayfair case. According to the report, following the 2018 Wayfair US Supreme Court decision eliminating the physical presence standard for sales tax nexus, 43 of 45 states with statewide sales taxes have adopted collection and remittance obligations for remote sellers, and 38 have implemented marketplace facilitator regimes. For a copy of this report, please go to our website or app. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had 
Two treaties signed, three treaties enter into force, and one protocol enter into force. I have three articles for you this week. The first article is called Implicit Support and its Implications on Guarantee Fee Pricing, Fact or Fiction. It's written by Gary Lambert, Amanda Pletz and Georg Detman and it's published in the Intertax Journal. As you know, we're still waiting for the OECD's final guidance on the transfer pricing aspects of financial transactions. This article raises some interesting issues on one part of that topic, the notion of implicit support from within a multinational group and its impact on pricing intra-group guarantees. The article starts by considering and comparing the two landmark cases in this area, the GE Capital case in Canada and the Chevron case in Australia. It then describes how the major credit rating agencies, Moody's, Standard & Poor's and Fitch, measure and account for implicit support. And the article concludes by considering two pricing methodologies. Firstly, the market approach, which is based on bond spreads and credit default swaps. And secondly, the actuarial approach, which is based on an expected loss model. The second article is called, It's Time to Update the Laffer Curve for the 21st Century. It's written by George Salas and it's published in Tax Notes Today International. If you've heard of the Laffer Curve and you're wondering what it's about and if it's relevant today, then this short article is for you. The author writes this, It's staggering to think that notes scribbled on a restaurant napkin can transform into a fundamental notion that has for decades served as a rationalisation for major tax cuts. That's just what occurred in 1974 when US economist Arthur Laffer sketched out a simple yet powerful economic model while breaking bread with a couple of President General Ford's top advisers. The Laffer curve maintains that there is an ideal income tax rate somewhere between zero and 100% that enables governments to simultaneously lower tax rates while raising revenues. Laffer therefore asserted that some tax cuts would pay for themselves. However, new data and research offer compelling evidence that it is time to rethink the Laffer curve's applicability as a tax rate reduction justification amid 21st century political, economic and trade dynamics. And the third article is called Taxation of the Ride-Sharing Economy Source Taxation Through Service Permanent Establishment Provisions Revisited the case under the Argentine Treaty Network. It's written by Guillermo Tassero and Juan Manuel Vaquez, and it's published in the Bulletin for International Taxation. This article considers ride-sharing platforms operated by non-resident companies in the context of paragraph B of the optional service PE provision, which is set out in the OECD commentary on Article 5. That paragraph is similar to Article 5.3b of the UN Model Treaty. Both the OECD Paragraph B and the UN Article 5.3b share a common feature. The time test is applied to services performed for the same or connected projects. 
The article concludes that there should be no service PE. The authors consider that ride-sharing platforms provide a digital intermediation service, or hypothetically, and only for the purposes of this analysis, a transportation service to a number of unrelated customers in the market jurisdiction. In the ride-sharing platform scenario, there would be an indefinite number of projects in progress for an indefinite number of customers without a time frame reference. There is no connection or relation between the projects, and therefore they should be considered separately. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 20th of December, 2019. The ITB team will be having a well-earned two-week break. We'll be back full of life on Friday, the 10th of January, 2020. But until then, I'm Steve Towers, wishing you all a very Merry Christmas and a happy, healthy and wealthy 2020. And of course, have a great weekend.